Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome back to the Steinberg Hallian 7 tutorial series. Today, we're going to have our first look at sampling in Hallian. It's a very big subject. It's going to take us quite a while to cover everything there is to look at, but we need to start somewhere. And today, we're going to have a general introduction to the concept of sampling and have a look at some of the editor features. Hope you're enjoying this series so far. And if you are, check out the Patreon and channel member links below. It's a great way to help support my channel. Okay, let's make a start. What we've got here is an init program sample instrument. And as you can see in the program tree, we've got new behavior, yellow. We've not seen yellow before. This means we have a sample zone into which there is no sample loaded. So this is currently an empty sample zone. Let's load a sample into it. I'm going to do it from the media bay. I've typed in the search term chord 32. Now you should have access to this sample. It's a part of the standard Cubase suite. But, but if not, any sample will do. It's just basically something to get us up and running. I'm going to drag this sample into where it says drop sample here. That sample's been loaded into memory. And now if I press C3 on my keyboard, there's the sample played back. The program tree is no longer yellow. This sample layer now has a sample loaded onto it. Now there are many ways in which we can interact with samples in Hallian. Hallian is fundamentally a sample player in origin. That's where it started back in version one. But today we're just going to worry about two different editors, the zone and sample editor. In the zone editor, there are two subsections, mode and sample. You don't ever need to click the sample page. Every function that you can see here is available elsewhere in the program. And for today's purposes, we're going to ignore it completely. We'll jump back over to the mode section. The other editor, the sample editor, is where we do the majority of our editing and this is where we get the fully featured sample editor. So we've got four different playback modes. By default it's going to play back in normal mode which basically means the sample will play back in the order that it was originally loaded. We can however reverse it. You can see what's happened to the sample graphical display and now when I press a key that sample's played backwards. Now, did you hear that long tail? All of this silence, pseudo silence, is very nearly silence at what is now the beginning of the sample. Let's cut that away. We don't need to hear it. Jump over to the sample editor. I'm going to press A so that I've zoomed out to see the entire sample. And what I want to do is chop off the first second of this sample playback. This X axis is in seconds. So I want to do something to cut this first second off. It's very simple. In the top left hand corner, we've got this little orange box, set sample start. I'm going to pick that up. I'm going to drag it over to the one second mark. And now when I press a key, the sample playback begins from this point. Now that's the correct behavior for when you press a key, but you can actually play back this sample from within the editor itself and you get different behavior. So if I click here, for instance, this black line indicates where the sample will be played back from within the interface. In order to do so, I need to press this little play button that says play sample. As soon as the sample's finished playback, it jumps back to that same position. So I can do that any number of times. If I want to set a new start point, I just click somewhere else in the screen. But this black line has nothing to do with what will happen when you press a key. In that situation, Playback starts from this S marker. Now, did you see that when I pressed that key, our black line disappeared? That's because we have a feature currently enabled called follow sample playback. It's this symbol here. And this basically means that the key overrides the manually specified position that I set with my mouse. And because I held the key down long enough to get all the way to the end of the sample playback, once we got there, basically jump back to the beginning again and the black line is kind of virtually sat here waiting to go again. There it is. Now this time I let the key go before it got to the end and so the marker stays where it was. It kind of sticks. If you want to dissociate, if you want to disconnect that behavior between the mouse and the keyboard, disable this follow sample playback and now the key has no interaction with this black line and you still have full manual control of it. There's another function worth mentioning while we're here, the auto scroll immediately to the left of the follow sample playback function is worth looking at. I'm going to zoom in to this sample. Now I can pick up the thumbnail zoom and when I zoom, I zoom around 
this current black line. So if I set the black line here and zoom in, you can see exactly what's going on. Now that I've zoomed in so far, we can no longer see all of the sample. So if I press a key, we're gonna play back the sample and keep track of it because we have auto scroll enabled. If I disable auto scroll, we only see the part of the window visible as the strobing line passes us. Generally speaking, your standard practice is to have both of those functions on most of the time. It's very rare that I want to disconnect what's going on with the keyboard from what I can see, but sometimes you do want to be able to manually edit something that you're looking at and not have the interface take it away from you. So that's two playback modes, normal and reverse. Instead of jumping over to the zone tab, which I could quite easily do, I'm gonna go down to the bottom of the sample editor where I've got access to the same functionality. Playback mode can be accessed from down here as well. This time I'm gonna switch it to one shot. So this is a forward only sample. So you can see the samples flipped back round again, but this time the keyboard acts as a trigger instead of a gate. In other words, the moment I press the keyboard, the entire sample will play back. This is most common for percussion sounds where you want to have the entire sound when you hit a drum, you don't want it to stop off, stop you know, brutally halfway through the sample playback. So you put the sample in one shot mode and it'll play the entire thing. And then you have a reverse equivalent of that as well. Reverse one shot. Let's go back to normal mode and jump back over to the zone section. Next command along is fixed pitch. If I enable that, every key I press on the keyboard is gonna play back the sample at exactly the same pitch. This is not as pointless as it seems because what we've got now is the keyboard can potentially act as a modulator rather than a pitch controller. If you have, for instance, if you've got a sample that doesn't care about pitch, then you can use your keyboard as a kind of key follow tracking for filter purposes. I'll show you an example of that. I'm gonna load a second sample into memory. I'm gonna leave the first sample behind and load the second one into a new slot. And this time I'm gonna search for Cinema Percussion 01. Now there's any number of ways I can add a new slot to the rack but the easiest is to simply pick the sample up and drop it onto the plus symbol. And the advantage of doing it this way is as you can see, the slot name has been updated to Cinema Percussion 01. Let's rename this first slot just to keep everything clean. I'll call it C minor chord. And now what I need to do in order to be able to hear this second slot is first of all, set the routing correctly and then solo it. So now when I hit a key, this is the only thing we're going to hear. It's a little bit loud, this one. So that's not so much a tuned sound, that's a percussion sound. If we fix pitch and open our filter editor, let's set up a filter with an intense key follow so that the low keys play a dull sound, the higher keys, play a higher cutoff version of the same sound. Now I've got some sort of interesting filtered version of, of that sample spread across my entire keyboard. The only thing the keyboard is doing is altering the filter cutoff. Samples being played back at the same pitch for every key. The preload and quality options, generally speaking, you can leave them set as they are one and standard. Allian doesn't load all of its samples into memory all of the time. It only loads a fraction of them. And these numbers represent basically like an increasing proportion of the amount of the sample that's actually going to get loaded. How much, how big this buffer is, is actually set in your options editor. And it's this maximum preload value here. I don't want to get too hung up in these details. These are features you only really need to worry about if your system is stressed for either CPU or memory. You might need to manipulate these values to either give you less or more preload depending on which part of your system is stressed. And I'm generally perfectly happy leaving them at the default values. Let's head back to the chord sample and take it out of fixed pitch mode. And then we'll have a look at warp mode. What this basically means is that as things stand at the moment, the pitch, the, the sample is going to play back at different pitches when I press different keys. 
What's actually happening there is that the sample's being played back at a different speed. So one octave higher than its native pitch, which is what I just played there, it plays faster. Another octave higher, it plays twice as fast again. And eventually it's like almost unrecognizable because it's being played so quickly. We can actually apply audio warp to the sample so that all of the samples are played back at the same speed. It's basically going to be stretched in time. So if we engage warp mode, and we'll start off with solo, this is the least CPU intensive, but the lowest in quality as well. It's the one that's recommended for po polyphonic sounds. So here we have basically a tonal instrument. This is polyphonic. So you would typically want to use solo mode for something like this for CPU preservation purposes. Those two samples are being played back at the same, sp at the same speed. Basically, the higher sample has been warped or stretched in order to play back over the same time as the lower sample. Now I'm going to introduce my third sample in order to demonstrate this a little bit more clearly. This time I'm going to search for 18 vocals and drag this sample into Hallian. Again, correct my routing and solo it. So we've got this. Long oh, silence, followed by some vocals being sung. If I play that sample back four semitones higher, Ooh, very clearly being played back faster. Let's make those two samples run at the same speed. Ooh, baby. Let's get rid of this big period of silence at the beginning into our sample editor. Pick up my sample start and back over to the zone. Ooh, baby. Now at the moment, that sample's not actually playing back at the natural pitch of the sample itself. Hallian has identified quite correctly that the original tempo of the sample is 90 beats per minute, but sync mode is currently set to tempo, which basically means it's taking its steer from the host tempo, which is currently 111 BPM. There are two ways I can correct this. I can either change my host tempo to 90 BPM or take myself out of sync mode. They both work perfectly well. I'll set Cubase's tempo to 90, play the same key again. Ooh, baby. Let's play a chord. Ooh, baby. Now the upper note Ooh, baby. is very slightly munchkinized. As soon as you start moving away from the original pitch, if when you do any warping on complex samples like vocals, you're going to get that little bit of a kind of artifact uh, introduction. And one of the arts of sampling is basically learning how to minimize that effect. One of the tools at your disposal is formant control. So these are individual frequencies that humans are very good at tracking and they, they represent the vowel sounds. And what you can do by adjusting the key follow for the formants, if you increase the key follow a little bit, it basically makes those formants track with the increase in pitch. Ooh, baby. Ooh, baby. What I want to demonstrate for the moment while we're on this vocal sample is the legato feature. So this time I'm going to play two notes but stagger their playback. Okay, so they played back as played on the keyboard. When I enge uh, engage legato mode, however, the first note that gets played um, takes on the role as an anchor and any subsequent voices that are introduced will play in sync with that first voice. So I'll do exactly the same thing again. Ooh, baby. So that time, even though the second key was pressed significantly after the first, it played back at exactly the same point and they both played the same phrase. They both sung the same phrase. Ooh, baby. Let's bring in our fourth sample. This time, 01075 drums. Let's drop that in. So now we have a completely pitchless drum rhythm. Ooh. Oops. When I solo it properly, we will.
Similar kind of situation though, at the moment we don't have warp mode engaged. So if I press any other key, it pitches the entire sequence. We're going to engage warp mode, but this time I'm not going to use solo, which is primarily for tonal or polyphonic instruments. I'm going to use music mode. This is a more CPU intensive warping algorithm designed to be better at identifying transients, which is what we need in the case of a drum rhythm. So now there's my basic rhythm. Original tempo has been correctly identified as 75 BPM. I'll just lock Cubase to it. An octave higher. So it's pitched it, but it's playing it back at the same speed. And now if I lock in Legato, I can play multi-pitched versions of the same percussion rhythm simultaneously. And I don't have to worry about pressing the notes simultaneously either. So it's done that via transient detection. It's figured out where all of these beat markers are and it's doing a pretty impressive job of pitch correcting the second rhythm so that it plays in time with the first. The final warp mode that we've got available is kind of a combination of solo and music. So spectral mode has all of the advantages of music mode in terms of transient detection, but you also have the individual pitch manipulation tools that we had in solo mode. So now I can start playing with the formants on a fundamentally percussive or monophonic sound. Final couple of things that I want to look at today, I'm going to use the vocal sample to demonstrate them. The first one is normalizing our sample. So there's a normalize function um, in the top bar, which if I press now, isn't going to do very much. Can you see this transient here is very nearly at zero dB anyway. I'll click normalize, basically nothing moves. But that's because we're normalizing the entire sample. What I'm going to do is extract one phrase at the moment, I have my range selection tool enabled, which means if I click, you know, this black line that we were playing with before, that's actually a range selection tool. If I click at the beginning of the second phrase and start dragging, you can see this colored zone appears. Now I can crop the sample so that that's the only part of it that's played back. We have this trim sample function, click that. And now this is the entire sample. The sample behind the scenes has not been disturbed or um, interfered with in any way. The original wave file is still completely intact and we can undo all of these functions, these operations and get back to that original state. In fact, I can demonstrate that now just by clicking revert to full sample. Here it all is. You never destroy the original wave underneath. You're always editing like an internally cached version of it. But now that we have this single phrase, let's just play it to hear it. If we normalize this sample, you will see it get bigger because this part of the phrase isn't anywhere near zero dB. Now play back the normalized version. So that's been normalized to zero dB. We could normalize to minus one instead and it'll just reset it to that value. So again, normalize is not a permanent operation. It's simply a mask that's being applied to this underlying data and we can always change our mind and switch to a new value and normalize to that instead. Finally today, one last thing I'll show you, pitch detection. We have a show pitch detection curve. I'm gonna click this icon. This is what Halion thinks is the pitch curve for the sample. And if we hover over the red line, you can see it pops up. It thinks that's a B3, very slightly flat B3. And that'll do us for today's episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Please hit like if you did. I'll see you next time. Thanks very much.